There we go. Oh, oh great. Because I had an ad, my live is now actually not live anymore. This is fantastic. Um, in fact, I'm going to reload the page really quick. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, Steve Rudzinski here, uh, the director of Everyone Must Die, the film that you just watched. Uh, hopefully it made you all laugh. Uh, I've also directed The Slasher Hunter, uh, Super Task Force 1, and the upcoming Captain Z and the Terror of Leviathan. Ah, oh, Just a Girl is actually in the chat, that's Rebecca Campbell from the film, and uh, Alina Isley was around. So yes, please, anyone that has questions, please ask. I got into filmmaking because when I was 12 years old, I watched Army of Darkness on the Sci-Fi Channel, and that's when I made my decision for the rest of my life. <clears throat> so uh, from there on out is when I knew I was going to make movies. At 16, I started kind of doing it, and they were terrible. Um, same when I was like 18, 19. Uh, back in 07, I tried... I mean, I made uh, the Wolfster Double Feature in like 2006, and I made a couple other movies in 05, and... I get an 06, but in 2007 was my last really bad film, Basic Slaughter. And uh, that one was not that good of a film. You can still find it on Amazon. But that's where I first started to come up with the idea of making these sorts of slasher movies and just this style of films. So when 2010 is when I got back into more seriously making films with The Slasher Hunter, an online short film, and then everyone was dying. You know, I made two more movies this year, and I have two or three more planned for next year. Yes, absolutely. Army of Darkness builds the movie makers. Uh, it's it is my favorite of that trilogy, personally. I know that some people don't like it as much because it's not um, <laughs> as scary, but. Uh, any big decisions go into making the effects and who to cast in my movies? Uh, well, when it comes to casting, whenever I write a screenplay, I don't go out of my way to super describe the characters, and I know a lot of filmmakers do that, but I like to try to keep it as blank as possible so that I can legitimately look at who is just the best actor for the role. Uh, I like trying to figure out you know, looking at every single headshot, uh, looking at a bunch of auditions, and then figuring out who would be best at who and who they are interested in playing. Um, and that's honestly what goes into casting. It's just, it's never a case of, like, they have to be like that. It rarely is like that. Once in a while, I'll specify that a character has to have red hair or something to that effect, but that's the maximum amount that I put into thinking about casting ahead of time. Um... As for effects, it's always that case that I like to combine uh, real physical effects with touching it up with CG effects. I really don't like the filmmakers that use too much CG when it comes to stuff. Um, but I also don't like filmmakers that go out of their way to not use any CG at all. Because I think that combining the two gives a nice symbiotic relationship. Um, like, for example, with the uh, Adam machete in the back of the head that wouldn't have looked as good if we tried to do that pure physically. Like, we would have had to cut away to a dummy head or put some sort of blood pack on the back of his head and actually hit him, and it still wouldn't have looked as good as straight up hitting him, adding a digital blood, and then cutting to real blood. Um, okay, what has the response been for your films so far? Have you entered any film festivals? Uh, for the most part, a lot of people have liked Everyone Must Die. Uh, it has, you know, like... 40 or 50 votes on IMDb is sitting at like a 6.0, which I think is more than fair because this is, I, I think it's a really funny movie with a pretty unique take on the slasher genre, but it's not great or flawless by any means. Um, most of the reviews, again, have also been very positive. Ain't Cool News even gave Everyone Must Die glowing, a glowing review. And DVD Verdict, uh, DVD Talk, they've also really liked Everyone Must Die. So most people have really understood why, 
was doing with this movie, which is awesome. Uh, I haven't entered any film festivals because I just don't like them. I don't like the idea that you have to pay a group of people money so that they watch your movie and then maybe they will show other people your movie for free. I, I just I don't like the film fest aspect. Like if there were if film fests were free to enter, I might buy into it more and send out my films a lot more. But the fact that most film fests cost a minimum of like thirty dollars to you know up to five times that, it's just not worth it to me. I'd rather take my movie to conventions, have a screening at the convention, because that gets to the audience just as well, except that I'm also there selling my movie, and that way I can actually talk to people. Uh, where does most of the filming take place for Everyone Must Die? A good chunk of the filming took place in Wheeling, West Virginia. Um, there are a lot of cool locations in that area, but what happened with that was the Originally, the budget for Everyone Must Die was uh, a little bit higher. I was aiming for more of a uh, six to nine thousand dollar budget, which didn't work out. You know, it just didn't work out. I wasn't able. I was overestimating the crowdfunding, which I haven't ever done again. So what I did was I reworked the budget so that I could just self-produce it myself. It was about twenty five hundred dollars production budget, and then I did raise a thousand dollars via crowdfunding for the editing and the um, composition prices. So I was I had less money to work with to make the actual film. So what I did was I just looked around for people that I knew had houses that were usable. And my friend Aaron, who is the executive producer on the film, and he plays Winslow in the post credit scene and in Slasher Hunter and in Captain Z and in the upcoming Survivors movie, which is not going to get filmed for a while yet. Um, but he has a second house behind his house that is just totally unused. So I asked if I could use it. And we literally just tore it apart, uh, cleaned it up, and made it a, look like a livable house, even though no one had been in there for months and months and months and months, if not years. Um, the convenience store was in Wheeling, and um, the camping scene was shot near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in a park that we got um, some permission to shoot in. So that was nice, especially because it was way cooler in that part than it was in Wheeling. Yeah, I, mean, fest I understand why festivals often charge, someone just pointed out festivals, uh, they support film festivals that don't charge submission fees. Uh, to a degree, I understand why some festivals, if not a lot of festivals, charge something because it does cost money to put it together. Uh, although I, I do think that a lot of them charge too much because they are getting ticket sales and the like. Unless they're also a free film festival, then never mind. But I feel that if you're getting ticket sales already, you're double dipping by also charging the filmmakers. Especially since there's no guarantee that the movie will even be watched, never mind screened. Yes, as Elena Isley just pointed out, it was oh, it was literally a hundred degrees every single day of the shoot. An unlimited budget, what would my dream movie be? I mean, that's a big question, because I've made a few of my dream movies. I've just made them on, like, no money. Um, I, yeah, that's honestly a really big question. Like, if the first thing I do might be just remake a couple of my movies that I made for, like, $2,000 that I'd rather make with more money than $2,000. Uh, I mean, I'm my brain is always moving, and almost all, every single movie idea that I come up with, I make. Because I'd rather make it and set it on a shelf to sell, even if it's not the perfect version of the movie that I would like it to be. Because then I did it, and it's there, and no one else can do it now. So I could always revisit it later. Um, I mean, granted, there's always the dreams of, like, I'd really like to make a uh, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers reboot-style movie. I'd love to make a live-action Ronin Warriors movie. I'd love to do my own Nightmare on Elm Street film, except go fucking crazy with it. Oh, can I say fuck on this horror channel? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Um, there's no nudity or swearing aloud on this channel. I apologize. Um, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of... If I had an unlimited budget, I would be making an unlimited amount of movies, you know? Like, it wouldn't just be like, here's an unlimited budget, make one movie. It would be, here's an unlimited budget, I'd be like, sweet, I'm gonna make, like, 50 movies with this, okay? Also, I get paid unlimited. If it's an unlimited budget, I feel that I should make infinity. Uh, so, I'm sorry. That's not a good answer for your question. It's just, 
I'm, I'm so busy making the movies that I actually do want to make that giving me an unlimited budget would just make me make those movies better as opposed to like, oh man, I can't make this movie until I get X amount of money. And I probably have a couple name actors, a couple guys that I'm like close friends with but can't afford right now. Um, like I could get like Nip Goger or Doug Bradley, a couple guys that I hang out with, uh, Kane Hodder, just to cool, do cool, you know, character cameos. I'd love to f- actually hire Bruce Campbell or Bob England for something. Those are two guys that I've definitely looked up to watching as an actor, um, as opposed to like a director hero, but like those, I would love to work with those guys, especially cause I think Bob ain't got that much time. So I got to hire him soon. All right. Uh, Dan here has asked, um, have you had any big ideas that you believe most directors or writers are scared to take risks on in low budget filmmaking? Uh, I mean, super task force, I feel is a pretty good example. I mean, I dealt with a lot of bullshit resistance when I was thinking about making that movie and started to release trailers for that movie. Just people that didn't understand that it was being made for $2,000 and the fact that it was being made at all, um, was practically a miracle. Um, just a lot. I think that a lot of independent directors, and not all of them, you know, I, Dustin Mills is a great guy that takes huge risks on his filmmaking, and I respect him beyond belief because of how great and original his films are. But a lot of directors just do the same. Hey, put these five kids in a house and kill them. Um, they wronged the killer somehow twenty years ago, so he's taking revenge or something. I don't know. Uh, that's what I try to do with Everyone Must Die as well. I just wanted a different, more unique uh, take on slasher films. <laughs> so, I wanted to... I think that's really just the thing. Just not enough directors are original with their ideas. I think they're they're afraid to take those kind of risks to do stuff like um, off-the-wall humor or just more humor, because like uh, Aline pointed out earlier in the chat, a lot of independent slasher films take themselves too seriously and while taking yourself seriously definitely works if the story's interesting enough it oftentimes just isn't um i've worked on films that would have greatly benefited from being funnier and there was like no humor allowed on set and because of that the films just simply suffered straight up because of it because it was just it's a boring story with no entertainment value humor wise kills aren't that good you know etc 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 um, so I, I just hope that with more stuff, especially in the I Just Made Captain Z, it's about a time-traveling pirate that fights a, a hillbilly demon family. I, I just I hope that my stuff keeps getting out there, and maybe more independent directors will look at that and be like, I should make something that's as weird as a time-traveling pirate, or I should make my own tokuzatsu, as opposed to, I'm going to make my own version of Friday the 13th, as it's happened 50 times. All right. I drive a shitty car. <laughs> Do you have any crazy stories for set injuries, police involvement, etc.? Um, in regards to everyone must die, there weren't that many crazy stories. It was such a quick shoot that everyone was losing their minds enough that like nothing was really happening. Um, during the op- the opening. Um, scene where we first meet Nick is where um, we had to break into Derek's place of employment and film super quick but we didn't know we were breaking into Derek's place of employment we thought we were allowed to be in there so Derek kept looking around as if like we were doing something wrong we were like what the fuck are you doing Derek and then when I posted a picture of the workplace on the Facebook page Derek got in trouble at work sorry he, his boss didn't care that much. It was just a case of, like, his boss didn't know, but uh, there wasn't any police involvement. You know, we had full permission to be everywhere where we were. Um, there was an asshole neighbor that lived next door to Aaron's who kept on trying to make our days terrible and, like, just making the shoot as a whole much more difficult. But it wasn't even that crazy of a story. Like, there's no funny stories regarding that. Or as, like, other... Uh, Captain Z, actually, there's two stories that are kind of funny to me on the first night of shooting captain z which you have no frame of reference for this because there's no trailer there's no plot outline there's nothing there's there's a movie i made called captain z and the terror of leviathan but the first night on that it was a um sacrifice scene like the demons were sacrificing this girl tied to a tree 
uh, and torches and flaming. We had full permission to be there. We told the city what we were shooting, where we were shooting it, when we were shooting it, that sort of thing. But then a cop shows up, and so I, as the director, and Zoltan, as the producer of the film, uh, go up to the police officer, and the cop just goes, so we got a phone call that a group of cultists were sacrificing a girl to the devil. And we were just like, well, we can't really be mad because that's pretty accurate. And the cop didn't care because he, as soon as we said what we were doing, he was like, oh, okay, yeah, and left. Um, and then as for injury, um, on Everyone Must Die, not really anything. I, Whenever the killer was supposed to get super beat up, I would put on the costume. <clears throat> except for one time when Aline Isley was dressed as the killer and kept getting hit with a stick. And she couldn't handle that. Um, and then I cut Aline Isley's leg open with a chainsaw on the set of Captain Z because she didn't want the blade getting taken off. And instead of saying, like, no, you're an idiot, we're taking this blade off, I went, okay. And then she cut her leg on, the, on a chainsaw. It wasn't on. It wasn't on. There was just a blade on it, and it dropped and hit her leg. Um, so it was just a cut. Not a big deal, but it was still a case of oh my god, everything is wrong right now. <clears throat> uh, any other... <laughs> yeah, she was a complete trooper about it, too. Um, I mean, she was a great antagonist in Captain Z. Hopefully, uh, I can get you guys the trailer for that as soon as that's done, and maybe we can have a screening for Captain Z on here one day. Uh, does anyone out there have any other questions? Because we got about 30 minutes to uh, the chat. Who influences me as a director? Um, that's a mix. Uh, early Sam Raimi uh, is definitely one of my most early influences. Um, he His style was always a case of, like, you know, he could tell a serious story, but he never took himself seriously and i like that a lot uh ditto robert rodriguez i think is an amazing director and i wish he directed way more stuff because it's he has such a great comic book style that it it just it brings the story to life no matter how mundane it is like even R robert's worst movie isn't that bad of a movie just because it's so fun to watch I'd say those are my two big ones when it comes to uh, director influences. All right. Uh, did you did you grow up in a small or big city, and did your environment make you feel like you could tell stories? Uh, I grew up in the Pittsburgh area, but I lived in the uh, suburb, so barely counts, and I barely have ever gone to Pittsburgh. Um, so it's it's like that medium sized city where it's big enough to be considered a legitimate city, but it's not a big city. Uh, as for my environment, having me tell stories, I was an only child uh, with a single mother, and at the time I had no really discernible skills. So in school, I just eventually figured out that if I was funny, people would look at me and pay attention to me. And that just evolved into me becoming extremely creative to deal with a lot of my terrible at-home environment uh, growing up throughout my entire life. You know, it's, it's that thing where if you... Oh, did you have a really normal life? You probably aren't interesting at all. So, uh, I just... Be, was I've been creative my whole life because of that, I think, and it wasn't until later in high school when that turned into straight-up storytelling. And it just kept going ever, ever since. You know, my brain hasn't stopped. It's just crazy up there, I guess. Uh, if you could make one of your films over again in 3D or a future one, which one would it be? Um, be back before I became more professional filmmaking, I did this thing called the Wolfster Double Feature. It was basically two short movies that was one movie. It was like one feature-length movie, but there was a first half and a second half. And it was Wolfster Part 1, The Curse of the Emo Vamp, and Wolfster Part 2, The Wrath of the Egyptian Mummy from Egypt. And I always said that I really wanted... Wolfster Part 3 to be called Wolfster Part 3 in 3D. I think that every Part 3 movie should be in 3D. Uh, as for future films, my cinematographer has actually been looking into legitimate 3D filmmaking on the T3i, so we might shoot the next movie in 3D just because. I don't know if we actually will, but it's a legitimate possibility. 
Uh, the only question is how to transfer it to Blu-ray, because I've never made a 3D Blu-ray in my life. And then it just comes down to if the uh, distributor would want to keep it in 3D or not. It might be more trouble than it's worth, but I'd love to do it at least once. I think horror movies are the best things to be in 3D. Uh, the first time you ever screened one of your films for family and friends, were you nervous? What was the reaction? Is there a lot of support for the work? Um, I mean, it depends on which first time. Because, like I said, you know, I made terrible films when I was like 16 that were barely movies. Um, 18 when I basically evolved to the next level, but they still weren't that good. They were still shot on one chip cameras and stuff. Uh, you know, when I did online series like Two is a Crowd or VG Spoofs, uh, when I tried to make my first more legitimate film with Basic Slaughter, or when I actually. I uh, got more seriously back into filmmaking with The Slasher Hunter, but it was still short for the internet, or Everyone Must Die, which was like my first big chunk of money into a movie. But they're all so different that it's hard to say. I will say that generally, it's something that you definitely get used to. You are always you always have that little bit of nervousness when you screen a movie, no matter how many times you've done it. Because that's, no one ever sets out to make a bad film. Um, a lot of times, I'm sure you've seen movies that were absolutely terrible. There was a 99% chance that the people who were making it thought they were making a good movie. Um, and even if they realized that it's bad after the fact, they didn't realize it was bad until other people saw it and they saw why it was bad. Um, so there's always that, that nervousness of, man, I hope I didn't make a bad movie. You know, so long as people laugh, I'll be pleased. But as for the, the first time you know I can't even remember it's been so long I mean, it's been over a decade since my first 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 movie and I put movie in quotes in a big way um, as for support uh, when it comes to family my mother has supported me from day one when it comes to filmmaking she's put a lot of effort into making me feel totally in the right with this decision of wanting to make movies instead of having a real career or going to college at all and she's you know she would give me a little bit of money towards kickstarters or what have you so, I mean, when it comes to support from family, she's been amazing my whole life. Um, as for other people, it's a, more people some more support me than don't. You know, I always run into the, the group of non-creators that just want to shit all over everything. You know, whether it's on an internet forum or something, um, or somewhere on YouTube, or back in the day before uh, chat rooms were less prevalent, you know, just people in chat rooms or whatever. Um, there's always that group of non-creators that want to shit on creations without understanding what goes into it, how much effort it takes, and the fact of how many people do it. Like, there's, a, there's so many people that don't understand that there are movies that exist that aren't in Redbox or on Netflix. You know, I mean, there's, there's so many movies that are legitimately for sale in stores that people wouldn't even count because they don't see it in one of those other locations. And sometimes it's hard to sell it to them, but for the people that do get it, the people that do support it, I get a lot of people seem to dig my work. I have a very, very, very small, legitimate group of fans that I'm super thankful for, and they will always buy my films. And all of it, and again, with Zoltan, Zoltan watched Everyone Must Die and was so impressed by it that he hired me to make his movie. And there's no greater support than giving someone money to do a job for you. Now, are there any other are there any genres that you avoid because they feel overdone at this point? Zombies. I going back to Captain Z actually. Uh, Zoltan's first idea for Captain Z was Captain Z versus the zombies. You know, it was like hillbilly zombies or Indian zombies. You know, it was a bunch of different versions of zombies, and I I fought against it for. Because I didn't want to do it, I explained to him that we wouldn't be able to do it financially because you'd need a lot of money to pay all those extras, and we simply couldn't afford that. Plus, having an antagonist that could talk would be way more interesting for them in the film. So he believed me, but at the core of it, I just didn't want to do zombies. Everyone has done zombies, and I would like to continue not doing the zombies. Not in the sense that there won't ever be a zombie in one of my movies, especially because I do this weird big universe thing where, like, all of these slashers exist, like... All the slashers in the Slasher Hunter exist in the same world where the Everyone Must Die killers also exist. So I'm sh in this world, there are also zombies. But I just don't want to do a straight zombie movie. I haven't seen a really good original zombie movie in a very long time. And I legitimately am not sure if I would see a good legitimate zombie movie for a long time starting from now. It's just that so many people have done it so many ways that... It's so hard for that to be original. 
And that's not to say they don't exist, but if we're just speaking generally, I would say zombie films. All right. What was your experience with distributors like? Have you been able to get a good distro deal and that has been financially profitable? Uh, experience with distributors is always a uh, touch and go. I mean, there is a million reasons why a distributor won't pick up one of your films. And it, 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 will, it can have nothing to do with the quality of the film. It can have nothing to do with the marketability of the film. It just comes down to tiny, tiny things that do affect the marketability. Um, like Pop Cinema was said they really liked Everyone Must Die, but they just it wasn't right for the library. Um, I had a few other distributors get in touch with me about picking up Everyone Must Die, but their deals weren't good at all, so I said no. Uh, finally, MVD and I found each other. They contacted me about Everyone Must Die. And they offer me a really nice deal, um, and I really like how far they get the film out. You know, they have some on-demand options. They get it on cable <clears throat> and in a lot of stores. As for profitability, still not yet. I mean, a lot of distributors will charge you a bunch of upfront money, and a lot of it is bullshit. Granted, MVD charged me way less than most other distributors would, but every distributor does it. You know, they'll charge you six to $1,000 for authoring a DVD, even if they just copy the DVD that you sent them. And even if they don't, they're literally just making a menu and tossing the files on. <coughs> Something that I can do in 10 minutes. But that's that's part of the distribution deal. Um, sales for Everyone Must Die have been good because of the distribution. Um, several hundred people who would have never seen the movie have bought it via Amazon or a retail store. And more people than that have seen it that wouldn't have never seen it. But when it comes to profitability, you know, I, I still need to make several hundred dollars to start getting residual checks. And, you know, we've already passed the biggest chunk of sales for this film. So who knows if that'll happen. So I'm looking into self-distribution for some titles, distribution for other titles. It all just comes down to the movie. Like Super Task Force, no distributor will want that. It's such a niche audience that I'd rather just try to sell that one myself. Or is Everyone Must Die, or Captain Z. The production quality on Captain Z is so high that I'm sure someone's going to want it. Or the upcoming Karis Hell that Aline and I are working on. Uh, it's just such a fun slasher B movie that someone's going to want it. So you just got to, it's one of those cases of working your way up and just hoping that you catch on while also continuing to do your own thing. You know, I hate to, I'd hate to make a movie that's meant just for distribution even though I will add stuff into a movie to help it get distribution, but only if it makes sense in the film. It's a double-edged sword. Have you ever been distributed by a movie or insulted by a movie with its budgets, actor decision, or ideas? Disturbed, I'm sorry. Disturbed by a movie. Um, Okay, so here's the thing. Um, since I'm a filmmaker, I am very, very lenient when it comes to watching independent films. Very lenient. It takes a lot for me to think a movie is bad. And oftentimes, even if it's a bad movie, I won't outright think it's a bad movie. Because it, like, if their heart was in the right place, if the script was good, I can tell where things go wrong. And that's fine, because things go wrong. And sometimes it's a learning experience, whatever. Uh, so I usually, I usually compare like the budget with what they had to work with, with the cast, with the script and look at it as a whole, as opposed to just saying, Oh, that story was terrible while ignoring the fact that they were able to get together like money and a great cast or saying like, Oh, well that cast is terrible while ignoring that they had such a little amount of money. Um, usually the only things that can really get to me is if a script is not good because especially in independent filmmaking, if there was anything that should be good, with no debate, it's the script. It's free to write. Uh, if you are getting money together to make a feature film with a mediocre script, when the movie ends up mediocre, you have no one to blame but yourself. Um, and I'm very vocal about that. But really, that's that's really the main thing. Um, there are There are movies that I've seen that aren't necessarily bad, but have so much money that I can't believe they aren't better than they are. I can give several examples, but I don't like to name names. <laughs> um, and it's just like, you know, I'll watch these movies that are made for, you know, like forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. That's not as good as Everyone Must Die. And that's not to say Everyone Must Die is amazing. I've already said 6 out of 10 on IMDb is more than fair. 
but Everyone Must Die was made for $3,500 and was shot completely in seven days and cut together in a month and released a month after that before distribution picked it up and released it like nationwide. Um, so if I'm watching a movie that costs $60,000 to make and has been in production for months and in post-production for months and it's not as good as my crappy little $3,500 movie, that's when I start having a problem with that sort of thing. <clears throat> and it's like I said, it's nothing even specific. It's just that concept of watching a much more expensive movie, a movie with the budget of like three of my movies on a good day, not being as good as one of my cheaper films. That's that's just when I just shake my head and say, "What happened? Are you, like, is it a case of not being a good director? Is it a case of just uh, being in over their head of having too much money?" That's that's the sort of stuff that bothers me. <clears throat> that was the last question. Unless anyone else has anything else. No, there's two questions. Yeah, I answered both. An interesting discussion we've had with various directors and more concerned with making a film to create or if you are proud of how many films are marketable to sell to a wider audience. Oh, I don't have that on my screen. Oh, wow, I don't have either of those on my screen. Thanks to Elaine Isley over here hanging out. Her chat is up to date, whereas mine is not for some reason. Uh, what was the first one? Uh, are you more concerned with making a film to create art you're proud of or to make films that are marketable and can sell to a wider audience? Okay, am I more interested in making um, films uh, for art as a story to tell or making films that are marketable for profit? <coughs> I've gone into many arguments with people uh, specifically other filmmakers, because I feel that if you are a director, especially an independent director, but literally any director or a producer, here's the order that should matter to you. It's a business. You're an entertainer. It's a story you want to tell slash art. Um, to me, if you can't sell a movie at all, there's no reason to make that movie to me. Uh, you're making a product to sell, no matter how artistic it is or how artistic you want to be. It has to be something that you can sell at all. And it's not to say that I'm, I only focus on making films for the mass audience. I'm crying out loud, Super Task Force was a total waste when it comes to a mass audience. But it still has that niche audience that I knew would buy it and support it, and they have. If that audience wasn't there, if, it, if I was the only guy that liked Power Rangers and Super Sentai... I wouldn't have made that, but I know there's other people that like it. Um, and then next in line is the fact that, to me, it's, in addition to the fact that it's a business and I do want to make a movie that is marketable and able to sell and make some sort of profit, because if I don't, if I keep not making profits, I can't make movies at all. Um, I, it, I make a movie for it to be entertaining. To me, that's the most important thing, for the movie to be entertaining. Um, almost everything else is just fluff at the end of that. Because you can have an amazing story, or a terrible story, or great effects or bad effects, but if it's just fun to watch, sometimes that's enough. Like, sometimes that's legitimately enough. Um, oh god, I clicked on something, so now I can't see myself. Um, but anyway, I'm gonna keep talking, because I know you can see me. Um, so, like... It's Like I said, it's not a case if I only make movies just to make money, but if I didn't make movies to make money, I wouldn't be able to make movies. So it's super important. It's just not necessary all the time. All right. I drive, yeah. I, I get it now since I had to refresh. Thank you, though. Um, are there any independent movies that you've seen recently that you would recommend? Uh, independently... I really, I honestly think the most recent one I saw was Easter Casket, and I would absolutely recommend that to everyone. Easter Casket is a wonderful film. I've heard, and that was made by Dustin Mills, and I've heard great things about Skinless Pete, which I've not seen yet, but I still would like to. I think that's the most recent uh, independent film that I saw that I would absolutely recommend is Easter Casket. Uh, thank you for the compliment, Dan, but this is not Matt Smith. This is Patrick 
Troughton, the second Doctor, who is ultimate. But still, thank you. <laughs> oh, you wear a Easter casket on New Year's Eve? That is wonderful. Good. It's a really fun film, and when I, when I saw that, that's when I said, oh, hey, I can make Super Task Force 1, and that's when Dustin became my CGI guy for Super Task Force 1, and he did a bang-up job on that film. Okay, well, we got about 10 minutes. Uh, so I'm going to talk about some stuff that's coming up. Um, <clears throat> I would absolutely let you air that. Uh, Andy Hoare just asked if he could uh, air Super Task Force, and I would. It's not a horror film at all, but I would love uh, to screen it. Super Task Force 1 is a tokusatsu film, which if you don't know what tokusatsu is, that's a genre in Japan that's a massive genre. It's been around since 73 in its current form, and even before that if you include stuff like Ultraman and Godzilla. Um, but that is the genre that Super Sentai is a part of, and Super Sentai is what gets translated to Power Rangers here in America. So I made my own tokusatsu called Super Task Force 1. If you go to supertaskforce.com, you can find out a way to buy it or rent it or rent it for a dollar online. Um, also upcoming is Captain Z and the Terror of Leviathan, which is the movie I was hired to direct by the producer Zoltan Zilai. And that is about a time-traveling pirate, as I said. Um, there's a amulet called the Amulet of Leviathan, which, when read aloud by its cult members, I'm sorry, when read aloud, releases the Leviathan's generals into the body of who finds the amulet, and then if they succeed in sacrificing a very specific kind of girl, they release the Leviathan to raise the Earth. So, after stopping them in the 1700s, Captain Z gets stuck in a time vortex and gets sucked to modern day, where it's again up to Captain Z, Glenn Stewart, and Heather, an idiot that works at the local Captain Z Museum, to stop the cult of the Leviathan from destroying the Earth. Right now, there's no trailer for that. Uh, we're looking at a February release for that film, possibly March at the latest. But if you want more uh, information on that, if you go to facebook.com slash movie or just search Captain Z on Facebook, you should find it. There's a lot of pictures right now, and there's a lot of makeup effects, a lot of practical effects on that film. Uh, that's a movie that was made for like under $20,000 that's going to look like it cost $50,000 minimum that it made. <clears throat> so that's that, that one's going to be a real fun time. That one we shot in a lot of major locations, and that one's going to be very, very fun. If I could give any advice to an aspiring filmmaker, what would it be? Um, first and foremost, make sure your movie is fun. Make sure that there's a reason why other people would care about your project. And the biggest piece of advice, the biggest piece of advice is learn the phrase good enough. Uh, those two words will save your film, I guarantee it. Um, and I say that because there's a lot of filmmakers, especially on their first films, or if they write their own script and then direct their own movie, or just people that haven't made that many films, they think that everything has to be perfect. Every single shot of every single scene has to be absolutely perfect, and if it isn't exactly what they envisioned, then they can't move on. But if you understand that it's the whole project that matters, not just this one scene or this one shot, it's the whole movie that matters, it'll end up being better. Because if you waste too much time to get this one shot perfect, it probably still won't be perfect because nothing can be perfect. And if you waste all of your time on that, you're going to have way less time for the rest of your shoot from there on out. So eventually, if something's not working, you just sometimes got to say, well, good enough. Let's move on. I would have to, that would be my biggest piece of advice, especially to early filmmakers. Tom um, Mancini just super complimented Super Task Force 1, and I truly appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Andy Hoare just said, if you're, if you're just watching, um, uh, they've asked 30 directors that question, and I'm one of two that didn't say just do it. That's terrible advice. You shouldn't just do it. You know what happens when you just do it? You waste a bunch of time and money. Directing takes preparation and effort. It's something you have to actually focus on and stuff. You know, you can't just say like oh just do it yeah no that's not advice at all that's not advice that's 
It's like saying, looking to someone being like, hey, how do I drive this car? Just do it. That, yeah, that's going to work real well. No, you got to get, you put your key in the ignition, you turn, you grab the wheel, you know, make sure you go the speed limit, but don't focus on the road too much. And that, that's advice. Just do it is not advice. Everyone's just saying, just do it. Um, now, it, it does help a lot if you end a lengthy shoot and you say, well, I did it. That matters more than saying just do it is being able to say I did it <laughs> I have pissed off Nike I've lost my Nike sponsorship um, so Super Task Force 2 may struggle to occur now um, also I've been uh, we have written a few extra things there's not too much uh, to talk about yet because they're basically all in the pre pre production phase, like not even script wise. But I did write a screenplay for a Super Task Force One sequel. That is literally going to be a if crowdfunding goes through completely for that movie, it will get made. If not, I still haven't turned a profit on Super Task Force One yet, which is fine. It was a cheap movie to make anyway. Um, but if I can't make a movie on the first one, there's no reason for me to make the second one. A lot of the movie has a lot of fans, and a lot of kids love the movie, which is great and super flattering. But if if they really want the sequel, I'm going to need them to help me make the movie. And, you know, it will be through pre-orders. I hate taking straight-up donations. Um, Elaine Isley and I have written an outline for a horror movie called Caris Hell, which I won't reveal too much about, but it's about a murdering carousel horse that talks named Duke. He's the prettiest unicorn. Um, and he goes through and kills people. It's going to be a standard weird B-movie slasher that I fell in love with the idea when Aline told me, and we wrote a really good, funny outline in it, with a, even better characters than everyone wants to die by far. And I also wrote, worked on a script, uh, an outline for a script for The Survivors, which is going to be a sequel to The Slasher Hunter and Everyone Must Die, as well as featuring characters from Captain Z and the Terror of Leviathan, because all my movies take place in the same universe, except for Super Task Force 1. Um, that's going to be about Will, who's the only survivor from Everyone Must Die, the guy from the opening scene and the post credit scene, uh, being trained to be a slasher hunter, and teaming up with characters from the other movies, including the original slasher hunter, a new slasher hunter, um, Captain Z, Rosa, to take on the killer's organization from Everyone Must Die. And you'll get to find out who is running the organization, why they're running the organization, just exactly what it is. Treevenge is amazing. Yes, any final questions out there? Uh, I have ten viewers right now, uh, five of which are in the chat room. Three I personally know, and two are the moderators, so I had a great turnout. I'm just kidding, it was fine. <laughs> it seems that's it. I don't see any other questions popping up here. Unless my chat is tor terribly broken, I don't know. Okay. Thank you so much for having me, uh, Indie Horror TV. I really, really appreciate this. Um, thank you, iDry, for showing up. Uh, thanks to everyone for watching and for the support. I truly, honestly appreciate it. You know, if, if you stuck around through the whole movie and you're still here, thanks for watching my stupid little movie. Uh, it wasn't anything fancy, but I hope it made you laugh. Uh, thank you, everyone. Really appreciate it. Great chat. Thanks for watching the movie. If you really like it, feel free to buy it. Yay! If Super Task Force sounds interesting, you can rent it for a dollar. And uh, I'd love to be back with future films.